Senator John Edwards. Thank you, Martin, very much for that wonderful introduction. Thank all of you for being here. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge a, a woman that I've been married to for a long time who traveled with me uh, for this great uh, occasion. And a lot of you know her story and what she's gone through over the last couple of years. But uh, the good news is her health is good. I want to acknowledge my wife, Elizabeth, who's with me here today. I also want to thank all the extraordinary clergy who are here for all the great work that you're doing, and also, Martin, for helping bring light to an issue that America needs to think about, focus on, and not just talk about, but actually take action on, which are 37 million of our own people who wake up every day worried about feeding and clothing their children. It's not okay in the richest nation on the planet to have that be the case. And I also want to say a word about my brother from North Carolina, Dr. Forbes. Um, Dr. Forbes, I want you to know I was in North Carolina growing up when you walked into that Woolworth lunch counter. I remember it vividly. And I want to say to every man, woman, and child here today that when Dr. Forbes had the courage and the strength and the conviction to put his life on the line. He didn't, when he sat down, he stood up. He stood up for me, he stood up for African Americans all across the South, and he helped bring change to America. And we are proud of you in North Carolina, Dr. Forbes, just as I know everyone else here is proud of you. Thank you for what you've done. And I also have to say a thank you to Marion Wright Edelman, who I know will be uh, saying a few words in a few minutes, but uh, she's been such an extraordinary and passionate and courageous advocate, particularly for children, over a long period of time when children desperately needed her voice. Thank you for what you've done. And it's an honor, honor to be with all of you, although I'm sorry I had to follow Dr. Forbes I think somehow we should have worked it out that he'd come after me. Uh, it's an honor to be here in this extraordinary place, in this hallowed place, in this sanctuary where so many have stood together for causes of righteousness and justice. In this church, the faithful and the firebrand have stood together, and they've joined in the noblest pursuits in American history, the fight and struggle for equality and for peace. And the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. was, above all things, a man of peace. And 40 years ago, as others have said, a year to the day before he was shot and killed in Memphis, Tennessee, he stood in this pulpit, in this house of God, and with the full force of his conscience, and his conviction and his love for peace, he denounced the war in Vietnam, calling it a tragedy, a national tragedy that threatened to drag America down, to drag us to dust. As he put it then, there comes a time, not just for Dr. King, but for all of us, when silence is betrayal not just betrayal of your own personal convictions, not just betrayal of your country, but a betrayal of our, all of our joint responsibility to each other, to our brothers and sisters, not just in America, but all across the globe. And actually the thing that I remember most about that sermon, given a year before he died, is that he did not direct 
his demands to the government of the United States of America, which was about to escalate the war in Vietnam. Instead, he spoke to the American people, calling on us to break our silence, calling on us to accept our own responsibility and to help lead what he spoke of as a revolution of values. A revolution whose starting place is with each of us. But the force of that revolution is the belief that we cannot, cannot stand by and hope that someone else will right the wrongs of the world. And this is my view, is the heart and soul of what we need to remember. It is the heart and soul of realizing the dream. Because there does come a time for all of us when silence is betrayal. There does come a time when we have to, each one of us, refuse to wait for others to act. A moment when we realize, as one of Dr. King's great teachers, Gandhi, said, we have to be the change that we want to see in the world. That time is here again. It's with us today. Dr. King taught us well. I believe, as I know many of you do, that it is a betrayal, a betrayal to stand silent and watch 37 million of our own brothers and sisters who literally worry about surviving every single day. It is a betrayal to stand silent while the disparity between the rich and the poor gets worse and worse and worse every single day in America, in the richest nation on the face of the planet. And I also believe that it is a betrayal not to speak out against an escalation of the war in Iraq.